Hey everyone, Gil Gross here. All three members of the big three have advanced to the second round of this year's Roland Garros. Roger Federer beat Denis Istvan, Rafael Nadal beat Alexi Popperin, and Novak Djokovic beat Tennis Sandgren. I'm here right now to share with you guys a special excerpt from a show I do on another YouTube channel called Three, a tennis show also available on all podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but on the show today, we previewed Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic's second round matchup. So that's the excerpt I'm going to share with you. Earlier on in that show, we recapped their first round matchups, and we're going to be doing that throughout the week. So if you like what you see here and you want to follow the big three as we chronicle their runs through Roland Garros and really till the end of their careers, make sure you subscribe to three. I'll leave links in the description. Let's go to uh, the second round match. And uh, Rafa has Richard Gasquet, who he has a tremendous history with. Uh, 16 tour level meetings. Nadal has won all 16. But it would be inaccurate to say that Richard Gasquet never beat Rafa Nadal. What am I referring to, Joel? Well, you're referring to a term they played when they were very young, a junior tournament, and, and Gasquet won. Gasquet beat yeah. him there. And, uh, but, you know, I think there's, there's a great case. I remember covering a match they played at Roland Garros three years ago and contemplating both of them. Gasquet's had a wonderful career, fine career. And it's just the difference in how each was raised. Gasquet was put on the cover of a tennis magazine in France when he was, I believe, nine years old as a protege. He already had the, the beautiful one-handed backhand that all of my friends who have one-handed backhands talk to me about, have talked for years. And now they talk about sits sits to pass in his one-hander. And um, Gasquet, though, that almost may have set him back because he was so told what a great player he could be. I think if Tony Nadal had gotten word that Rafa could have been on a cover of a magazine, he would have banned that from happening. He would have said, there's no way you're going to be on the cover of a magazine. In fact, with that alone, you know what you should do? You should hand deliver magazines to everyone in the town. And I think there's just this whole approach to tennis, Gasquet's parents were pros. And, and I think Gasquet, by now having played Federer 16 times, I hope on the 17th, maybe he'll serve in volley 10 times. I mean, if you lose to someone that many times in a row who's that good on that surface, maybe you try something different or you just kind of, okay, go about losing three, four, and two, and maybe you take a set further. I don't know. What, 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 what coach the Gasquet for? Uh, I, Gasquet definitely knows where the ball is coming to the backhand, to the backhand, to the backhand. That's how Rafa plays one-handed backhand. So yeah, um, moon ball, you know, um, you can't really drop shot Rafa. I mean, what can you do to Rafa on clay? Okay. I know, I'll tell you something, but here's the thing. Here's how I look at the game. Here's how I look at the game. You're right. Okay. What can you do with Nadal versus on clay? But you go play someone who you're significantly overmatched with who you've lost 16 times. Yeah, I can hit my shots. I can feel good. I'll be in a number of rallies and maybe, yes, gay, look, he's a pro. He might extend him to an overtime set. He might even grab a set. But do I want to, how to compete against him effectively? So now what I should do is empty the kitchen sink. Why not hit some kicksers and try some serve and volley? Now, granted, you're at the limits of your skills development. And this gets to the big thing about how players build their game. And this is why I so like players like Federer and why I like on the woman's side, I like Katie McNally, people who are building the broadest possible arsenal. So when they have a chance to compete against someone who they're overmatched against, they might have some of these different, what shots in their arsenal they could do. So you're right. So otherwise Gasquet is going to know, okay, oh, here we go again. And Robert Roth is going to say, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm aware of your beautiful backhead. Go ahead, hit a few winners. We know what's going on here. It's going to play out like old times again, isn't it? So, would you go as far as to underhand serve? Would yes, you... absolutely, absolutely. Why not? Why would you, think... Gil? But, but, but you know, uh, I, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about Gaz K. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to accuse Gaz K uh, of this flat out. But, but you know that there are a large portion of players who have these kinds of head-to-head -head with members of the big three, and they walk on the court resigned. We're not, we're acknowledging that, right? That they're not, they don't really believe that they can win. 
I wouldn't say resigned as much as pragmatic. That you're not, yeah, like sort of aware. That they're they're quite aware of that such history. That's true. I think yeah. I think some of them go out there and think, boy, it would be really good if I could get a set. Or what can I do not to embarrass myself? Uh, unfortunately, yep. I think a lot of them have that in the back of their head. Well, Gasquet has had, a, yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's almost like you get Elizabeth Kubler Roth, Roth the, the five stages of, of tennis life and death of that you go through, whether it's, whether it's optimism, optimism, acceptance, denial. <laughs> come up with, I should come up with a chart. But like Gasquet knows he's not going to embarrass himself. In fact, Innovation, that's why he doesn't want to innovate because that makes him think he's going to embarrass himself. He'll, yeah. He won't embarrass himself if he loses three, two, and three, and it's a fair enough. He's a pro. He's not going to embarrass himself by losing. He's not going to get triple bageled. And what if he loses one, two, and one? Is that yeah, embarrassing? It's unfortunate. It's, no, it's a, but it's rough. It's clay, and he's too good, and I did my game. I, I remember seeing that. I've seen that numerous times instead of like, hey, open the box. You beat me 16 straight times. I got to try something. I'm going to serve from the doubles alley. I'm going to come in on your return. I'm going to just try a bunch of things and just, just, and I think, I, I, yeah, this is my way of, of properly regarding you. It feels scary to people to do that. I think, you know, it's, it does, it's just, of course it, it feels scary. Of course it's, but it's like, absolutely. It feels scary. I think it's, it, be it, brave. Was, it was scarier walking around with a mask for six months. <laughs> I mean, right, think about right. it. Yeah. Hey, so uh, you guys, um, have you watched any footage of the 13 year old Nadal Gazquet match? I, I tweeted it out today. It. I saw okay. some of it. Yeah. It's, it's fun. Well, I will, I will say this, the, my biggest takeaway Gazquet's game is beautiful, even at 13 years old, but my biggest takeaway was how far behind Nadal's serve was from the rest of his game. I'm stunned. I mean, his serve was really bad technically as a 13 year old, the rest of his game, pretty, pretty beautiful, pretty great. But clearly like the serve just wasn't valued. It was just, okay, start the point. He didn't use his legs. He was kind of uh, going backwards uh, away from the court instead of into the court. I mean, it was a real mess. And to a lesser extent, that's kind of how he entered the tour as a, as a teenager as well with the serve way behind the rest of his game. So you know, I find you that got the, uh, you got the Chris Lewitt uh, Spanish background. I'm going to keep hammering on you this for the next 20 years. What's the approach to the serve in that world? It's, uh, it's de-emphasized a little bit. Um, you know, you have to hit a kick serve. I'd say that's emphasized second serve, accelerate, hit it as hard as you can kick serve, need it righty backhand, but the, the development of the serve is kind of the win the point outright weapon, not really a thing. It's more about of a protect develop, yourself. How about the development of the serve as a gain a little traction to start the point? You know I mean? Instead of how, instead of, if yeah. you look at the serve as first down, instead of the serve getting you to second and eight, how about the serve getting you to second and five? Well, I think with the development of the forehand as a as the, your primary weapon, I think the serve comes into play there. Uh, ideally, I just no, think I'm not again, about it's... the serve plus one. I'm not talking about the serve plus one. I'm talking about the serve itself. I guess the clay is such a such a neutralizer that it's kind of like, yeah. why am I even doing this? So that's kind of interesting. And the young Rafa had that, but he's you know now it, it, it's very much for him. And we'll be talking about this more in the shows to come. The serve plus one. The combo. And I think it's changing, by the way. And I, I, I'm not on the grounds in Spain, but I do think that they're starting to uh, modernize and start to look at the serve differently and emphasize it more. Um, all right. Federer versus Chilich, Amy. Yeah, these guys have some history, right? Yeah, a lot of um, it. I mean, I... I Chilich has been a big server. I'm not sure what he's doing right now. Um, but again, we've talked in the show about how that's not really a factor. And um, Chilich certainly isn't the player that he has been when these two players have met in the past. I always think of the Wimbledon final in 2017, where Roger crushed him and it was heartbreaking, but this is interesting because they're both a little bit not who they have been. Well, right, and Chilich, though, I'm a little, 
I, I've always liked Chilich. I've liked his work ethics. I've liked his game. I've liked his back. And he's he's a lot. He's so he's one of the players I find he's um a little. He's a lot more fun to watch play in person than he is on television. Some, I, I find him more. Some players there isn't as wide a gap, but when I've seen Chilich play in person, I find him very dynamic. And I remember seeing him in Australia the year he got to the finals and he extended Federer to five sets in that final. Um, when he won the U.S. Open, beat Federer in the semis. That's his only win against Federer. He's one and nine. I, I was there. I was at wow. that one. Yeah. So, oh, we both, well, there we go. So yeah, pretty neat. But, um, and he, I, I expected after that 14 U S open win, I expected him to be more in the hunt more often. And it series of things. It didn't quite, it hasn't quite exactly gone that way. I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, I think for this match though, I don't know. Clay Chilich is another guy who seems to do better on, he needs the speed of the hard court. It's, it's, but yeah. I don't know. This is this is where we start to see signs of Roger. I mean, let's say they split the first two sets. Now we begin to see Roger's fitness and match play more. Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm looking forward to to that kind of test. It's certainly going to be a, a test, a bigger test than Istvan because Chilich has firepower and weapons. Uh, it's just there's been a lot of errors recently, and Chilich has struggled to win matches even when he's put himself in winning positions uh, because he's really really struggled over the last two, three years, ever since really Wimbledon 2018, he was a three seed and he lost to Guido Pela in one in the early rounds. And he was supposed to do damage in that tournament coming off the final. And that was for some reason, a turning point in his career. He never had great results after mm. that. It's the nerve management that I think have, has gone out the window for Chilich and in, in big spots he's missing and he just seems nervous uh, towards the end of his career, in the beginning of in the beginning and the middle of his career, he was handling those moments, and that's what has really left him. Well, you know, it's interesting. It made me think as you said that about sort of this. You know, we're looking at the three, and we talk about these contenders, but there are these these generations of people who've like, you know, tilted against the greats, and then they haven't, and then they, you know, whether it's Sanga or Burdick, and and Ferrer at least kind of brought it all in because he because of his playing style, but the ones with the with the bigger weapon games, they kind of huffed and they puffed and they couldn't blow the big three down. And then they just kind of like, Ugh. and maybe that's for you <laughs> of, of resignation because at, at least Ferrer had his eternal hustle that never let him down. So that was, he just kept on grinding and even he, and even he that reached the stage where even he found his empty mark. But it's just, it's just, you could almost do, you could almost chronicle these, these multiple generations. And it's like nothing in tennis history because these guys have lasted at the top so long. I've heard Chrissy and Martina talk about how they got more nervous towards the end of their careers um, because they, they kind of would think in the back of their mind, oh, how many more chances will I have? And I say this kind of not to, to make a point about Chilich, but to also appreciate what our three have done thus far, where maybe, maybe Fetters had some, some moments here and there where the, the nerves have, have gotten to him in a way that's been detrimental. But for the most part, these guys have, have maintained their steely nerve management in big matches and their record in major finals is what you would point to, to, to kind of prove that. Well, Federer was asked after the Istaman match, what's more important, confidence or experience? And he said, for sure, confidence. So uh, it doesn't appear that Chilich has a lot of confidence going right now. I would say that, but I would also say, you know, Roger Federer, that guy, he's kind of amazing. And yet it's like, yeah, that would be one of those things, hearing that is, yeah, he said that. What's that mean? Well, where do you get confidence? Well, experience helps. I mean, you know what I mean, it's like it's sort of like the way it's sort of like the way I was telling a coach once. I said, "Yeah, process this and process that, but you know, nothing really validates the process better than good outcomes." So Roger mm -hmm. can kind of what make experience number two, but golly, he and make confidence number one because he can kind of wax on it. But he's had a lot of good experiences. I think reps help confidence too, you know, and he's starting to get his reps up now. Totally. Oh, but reps, reps is in also like, how about the other 50 slam semis and finals? You know what yeah, I mean? True. Yeah. The, 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 the piggy bank, it's bigger than a piggy bank, right? It's a frig. I mean, if you like if viewed every player's experience, confidence as this sort of like bank account, may, maybe that's our study of like, 
you come up with multiplier percentages. Uh, it, it's sort of like the way I came up with this thing called the, the Grand Slam Multiplier Club. Winning one slam is one, but two is four, three is nine. You see what I mean? Like each slam, it's yeah. it's a multiplier. So 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 in a way, Federer has a four hundred factor on his slams. You see, which is tremendous. Good experience, right? Good experience builds confidence. <laughs> Bad experience doesn't. Let's throw that qualifier in there. Uh, Djokovic Cuevas. Um, this uh, this will be the first meeting between those two. What do you think of Pablo Cuevas, Joel? He's an interesting player. He plays well. He's done well. He's had some results. He's challenged people. It's, it's kind of that's a little more intriguing. Again, it's it's mm-hmm. nice to see how as we advance through the draw, you know, a little more tougher test. I mean, uh, I, I'm I'm interested to see that match. So I think you know Novak, Novak is so reliable. That's the thing with him. I find him so relentlessly reliable. I agree. I, Cuevas is a is a shot maker. That's where the flair is going to come from, which is going to be fun to watch because Novak's always so good at trying to neutralize and take those blows and to kind of um, throw the flames back where they came from. So 